Good afternoon. Thank you for watching the live briefing for Thursday, October 8th. Panicked there for a second because the wrong document came up and I wasn't sure what I was looking at. So let me get going here. Today I have a few brief comments uh, for you. Then um, you'll hear from your resident association president, Pat Kawana, in regards to the employee Christmas fund. Uh, we're real thankful to have Pat with us today. And then Lynn McClintock has our pastoral care segment uh, today. So a little bit of a uh, real quick COVID-19 update. Uh, we announced on Tuesday that we had learned that a security employee had tested positive for COVID-19. So he uh, is out uh, in quarantine until uh, he recovers. Currently, we have two employees who continue to recover at home uh, and in quarantine. Uh, uh, all of our, we, we don't have any residents currently uh, with, with COVID-19, but you'll recall that the residents in Parsons Health Center first floor are in quarantine um, because of a potential exposure from a couple weeks ago. Good news is they're all doing well. Uh, this, this week, all of those residents and staff have been retested and we're waiting on those results. Should get them back uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, so hopefully they'll all come back negative. Um, so far, everything we've gotten has been negative. We'll, we'll have all the results done by Tuesday, or we should. And so we'll know for sure uh, and, and we're really looking forward to that, to get that behind us. Just a couple of reminders about uh, our principles for infection prevention. Uh, please continue to follow all the principles um, that are laid out in, in all of our documentation. Um, they've kept us safe so far and healthy, and, and so we really want to ask everyone to continue to be diligent, right? Wear a mask. Keep it with you, um, especially if you're coming out of your apartment, headed down to the lobby. We, we know there's a lot of folks who are getting down to the lobby and being like, oh, I forgot my mask. Um, we're gonna, I think, put some more signage up to remind you, but, but make it a habit to keep your mask uh, with you. Um, I wear mine on my wrist, so I know where it is. Um, but just keep it with you, because it's, you know, we've all done it. We've all gotten to wherever we're going and realized we didn't have a mask. Uh, we need to wear it. It's required for everyone, residents, staff, visitors, anyone else, contractors who enter our community. Uh, and so we're thankful that you're, you've been compliant and so far we ask you to keep it up. Please keep it on at all times. Uh, and keep it when you're around people. It's really, really important. Um, we're starting to see people around campus that are getting a little uh, lax about it and pulling their masks down uh, when they're talking. And it's really important that that's, when you're around others is when you need to wear it. And I know it's hard to hear, um, that's um, unfortunate, but we, we really need uh, you to wear it. That's, that's the best protection, um, uh, except staying away from people, right? Keeping, keeping your distance from staff uh, as a resident is probably the best thing you can do. Um, you, you've heard it time and time again. New cases uh, that we're getting are coming in through staff who are asymptomatic. And so if you can keep your distance from staff and from any visitors, you're likely going to be fine. Uh, but wash your hands frequently, use hand sanitizer, and always just remember, just keep your distance. That's the big, best thing you can do. Anyone entering our community must be screened. Um, we have had a couple of times when people have come on visitation and gone right to the apartment. We need, we need them to all get screened, um, both so that we ensure that they understand the rules, they're well, and that they don't have a fever, but more importantly, so we can contact, well, just as importantly, so that we can contract trace. If, um, God forbid, somebody gets sick, we can find out who, uh, who they might have been in contact with. Um, it's really important. Um, if you're coming into the community, go to the Avalon entrance and get screened, get a wristband, um, and then don't, don't come and visit if you don't feel well. Uh, any, any symptoms, headache, um, scratchy throat, uh, stomach upset, anything. Don't, don't come that day. Come another day. Stay home if you don't feel well. It's really, really important. And for residents, if you have visitors in your home, please make sure you follow, that they follow and you follow all the safety guidelines. All right, so Westminster Canterbury has been continuing to work as a team. We've really tried hard to keep expanding our visitation as, as, it's, as we've progressed into this, and it's gone pretty well. Um, really, it's gone quite well. Um, so we know, because we hear it every day, 
There are independent living residents who have family members who want to come visit uh, from out of town and they would really like to stay in their home, in their apartment or in their home on the green or uh, Glebe or whatever the case might be. Um, we've tried to get through this initial phase of visitation before we allowed that. And so uh, we're, we think we're there now. And so our plan right now is to begin to allow overnight uh, stays in their apartment or home beginning October 12th. Um, so that's next Monday. Um, we'll be sharing more details in writing tomorrow and then again on Tuesday of next week. Um, resident services is going to need to work with you if this is something that you plan uh, to take advantage of um, because the process is going to be a little different. Uh, and we are going to require family members to demonstrate a negative COVID test before they come and spend the night, just like we would for someone who's being admitted into our facility. Uh, so the, the, you got to work with, uh, with resident services on the details. We'll also be giving them different identification. So if that's something you want to pursue, call uh, resident services. Ask for Emily Williamson at extension 6082, and we can get that process started for you, for your family members. Um, if, if, you, if this is something that you think is going to happen a little later, uh, in, uh, later in October, November, uh, uh, hold off until you get a couple of weeks out so we can get uh, the folder, be, get the conversation started, get the documentation together, uh, and make sure everybody knows what they need to do. So again, um, reach out to Emily Williamson uh, in, in Deborah Jacobson's office at 6082 if you have any questions. Um, the other thing we're moving towards is what, um, what's called general visitation, so non-family visitation in assisted living and, and healthcare. Um, we're not quite there yet, um, but assuming all things go well, uh, which I appreciate everyone's prayers and thoughts. Uh, it's, it's been a, a big help and, and it's uh, certainly supported us through the process. Uh, we hope to begin to allow general visitation on Monday, October 19th. We'll share more details next week. We have to get through this next um, two weeks before we'll be ready to do that. So thank you for your patience uh, and we'll let you know if the date changes. It might based on how next week goes. Um, but we're hopeful that the 19th we can begin some general visitation. Um, so please remember that all visitation um, and, uh, uh, and really our community's success uh, as we move forward here is really dependent upon everybody following the rules. Um, and it's contingent on not having any new cases of COVID-19 in our community. Um, this, this success depends upon you and your guests, um, and, and we're going to continue to do what we need to do, but we need you to follow the rules. Um, residents, please make sure your guests know that they need to be screened and that they need to be in good health when they visit. Um, and uh, please know that if we have problems with this process or we have an outbreak, we're going to need to both contract trace who might have been exposed um, and who visited who, and we also are going to need to be prepared to suspend the process uh, with very little notice. Hopefully that won't happen, but we need to be prepared for it if it does, because uh, it certainly could. If we have a confirmed case uh, in independent living or assisted living or anywhere, really, um, the guidelines will change, and they'll change quickly. Um, we will communicate this as soon as we're able, um, and so we encourage you, if you have any questions, or if you're having visitors, um, encourage the visitors to check out our website at www.wcrichmond.org um, prior to their visit. All the guidelines are there and, and available and, and all the contact information as well. Now, changing gears a little bit, uh, we've gotten um, a lot of uh, questions. Oh, I guess I didn't say what I was gonna say. I've had a number of people ask me about vaccination, COVID-19 vaccination, um, and as part of the governor's task force, it is something we talk about just about every week. Um, the Virginia Department of Health is actively planning for the process of vaccination. Currently, they're doing a couple things. Currently, they're surveying all the facilities in the state to find out what our intentions are as an organization or a group of organizations about vaccinating 
residents and staff. It sounds like the, the leaning is towards not making it mandatory, um, but that hasn't been determined yet. But the state is trying to find out what, what do facilities think about making it mandatory. Virginia Department of Health is also focused on establishing the processes for delivering the vaccine when it's available, resupplying it as necessary, and then capturing the uh, compliance reporting in terms of who gets vaccinated, who doesn't get vaccinated, that sort of thing. So all of that work is happening. Um, from what they're sharing on the weekly calls is there's, they're anticipating that we will uh, we will not see the vaccine until at least the beginning of next year uh, for staff and residents, that it would be you know, early next year at the earliest. Um, could change, and as soon as I know more, I'll certainly share it, but that's the, the most recent information uh, that I've been given. Um, the last thing on my list is just, we we're also getting a lot of people asking about the bank. Um, and. Um, it's been a few weeks since we've talked about the bank. Um, we're hearing a lot of questions, um, but the short story is really nothing's changed. According to BB&T, they still have no plans to reopen the campus branch anytime soon. Um, and uh, they encouraged anybody who has a lockbox and needs to get to it to contact Peggy at the Lakeside branch. Um, Again, she's been super helpful making herself available for those that need to access their boxes. And as soon as we get confirmation from BB&T Truist that they plan to reopen, uh, we'll, we'll certainly sh share that with you and, and with plenty of notice. Um, so next up is Pat Kawana. I'm gonna ask her to come up and talk to you uh, from the Resident Association and the Employee Christmas Fund. Uh, Pat. Good afternoon. I'm Pat Kawana, president of the Resident Association. And I'm here today on behalf of all residents to support our employee Christmas fund. Beverly Beck is the association chair of the 2020 Employee Christmas Fund Committee. So Bev and her committee members, Bucky Bear, his kids, and all residents, we know that our employees have always been very good every year. And we also know that this year, the year of the COVID-19, our employees have been exceptionally good. We know that because we see so many of our employees every day and all day, and they are actively providing us with the services needed to keep 850 residents well, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. But did you know that for all the employees we may see, there are an equal number of other employees that are working behind the scenes. Westminster Canterbury has about 619 employees now, according to Winley Gravitt, our Vice President of Human Resources. I spoke with her and a few managers of the larger departments to get an idea of how many, of how, how many employees are working behind the scenes. Dining services probably has the most behind the scenes employees. They provide 3,000 meals a day to all residents wherever they live at Westminster Canterbury. And this includes food purchasing, cooks, dishwashers, sanitation staff, servers, leads, and supervisors. And health services. Who would take care of us when we are sick? without the many CNAs, LPNs, and RNs who work days and evening shifts in the clinic, Parsons Center, Avalon, Monticello, and Gables. Many employees are also needed to do the paperwork in health services, document, the documentation required with all the surveys, federal and state surveys, medical records, and Medicare. In housekeeping services, who would keep our apartments and public areas clean and neat and looking good three, 365 days a year without our many housekeeping employees? These women and men 
clean our apartments, public spaces, set up for meetings and events. They collect and empty trash and move furniture and many, many more things. This department also includes day and evening shifts. Now we rarely see laundry employees. They are a part of housekeeping. Without these eight employees, we would miss that supply of service of clean, fresh linens for our apartments, as well as supplying health services and dining services with the linens that they need. We also have employees in other smaller departments who perform important functions behind the scenes to keep Westminster Canterbury operating smoothly. Finance and accounting, 12 employees keep residents financially secure by planning, budgeting, paying bills, and writing employee paychecks. The human resources workforce. Only the best employees are hired, trained, and oriented to the Westminster Canterbury Way by processing through this department of only seven employees. Lots of other support departments have employees we seldom see. A few others include engineering, building and grounds, purchasing, central stores, may the mailroom, communication specialists, information technology, child daycare, the security department, public relations, and the foundation staff, and all the administrative support staff. I apologize to the, one depart the, to the departments that I, I may have left out. I could fill pages with all the, those details. But each department and each employee are important and necessary to keep Westminster Canterbury the special place that it is. My purpose today is to shine a light on all of our behind the scenes employee heroes. To me, they are like the wind beneath the wings of the employee heroes we do get to see more often throughout the year and especially through this COVID-19 journey. Many of our employees and their families are experiencing health and financial hardships due to the coronavirus, and yet they try to be cheerful when they come to work every day to take care of us residents. We are so grateful for all that they do for us. In closing, my wish to all residents is please, please give generously to the Employee Christmas Fund. And next up is is Lynn McClintock. Good afternoon, everyone. I have a few announcements first from Pastoral Care. This Sunday, a sermon for every Sunday will be broadcast on TV 970 at 4 p.m. This is a service that we have been subscribing to to bring you excellent sermons every Sunday afternoon. This week's preacher is Reverend Carla Pratt Keys, who is the pastor of Ginter Park Presbyterian Church, so she's right around the corner. Her text is Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. She will be preaching on the parable of the wedding banquet. So we hope you will tune in Sunday at 4 p.m. on TV 970. The service for dedication of the Spiritual Center will be on TV 970 as well. That will be on Sunday, October 18th at 4 p.m. And that day we will not have a sermon for every Sunday. That is October 18th. That evening, we'll rebroadcast it at 7.30 p.m. And throughout the week, Monday through Thursday, it will be at 7.30 p.m. on TV 970 as well. We have finished taping for that, and it's in the editing process right now. We think it's a beautiful service, and we hope you will tune in. There's a lot to be thankful for with our new spiritual center. The Peters Lecture, which we have every year, will be on November 11th. That it will be on TV 970 at 4 p.m. Our lecturer this year is Heath Hardage Lee, who is an author, and she will present 
A League of Wives, the untold story of the women who took on the U.S. government to bring their husbands home, which was published in 2019. This is her latest book, and it features the true lives of wives of Vietnam veterans. Our lecturer, Heath Hartage Lee, draws from her museum education and curatorial background, and she has worked at history museums across the country. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in History and with honors from Davidson College, a Master of Arts in French Language and Literature from the University of Virginia. Heath served as the 2017 Robert J. Dole Curatorial Fellow. Her exhibition entitled The League of Wives, Vietnam POW, MIA Advocates and Allies about Vietnam POW and MIA wives premiered at the Robert J. Dole Institute of Politics in May of 2017 and is traveling to museums throughout the U.S including the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum through the year 2022. In addition to her writing success, the actor Reese Witherspoon's film production company, Hello Sunshine and Sony 3000, have optioned the book for a feature film, which is currently in development. Heath is no stranger to Richmond, or to Westminster Canterbury, because she is the daughter of Westminster Canterbury resident Anne Hardage, and the granddaughter of former resident Anne Purnell Heath. She grew up in Richmond, attended St. Catherine's School and St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. Needless to say, we are honored and excited to host Heath Hardage Lee as our 2020 Peters Lecturer on November 11th, at 4 p.m. on TV 970. More information on her lecture and on Heath will be in upcoming tales, so stay tuned. We do encourage you, if you can, to read Heath's book, A League of Wives, before her lecture. Several copies are in our spiritual library, and we encourage you to check them out. After reading her book, if you have a question to ask her when she is here, please contact Vanessa Perry at extension 1502. Mrs. Lee will answer some of the submitted questions as part of a question and answer segment after her lecture. There is a deadline for that, so stay tuned to the tales. But if you would like to check out the book, submit some questions, and they will be addressed hopefully at our lecture on the 11th. Many of us have on our minds these days the election. It's hard to avoid if we turn on our TVs, radio, or the internet. So at this time of intensity, it is helpful to stay grounded, to stay focused, connected to God, and connected to each other. Our scripture is Proverbs 3, verses 5 and six, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. I close with a prayer from the Book of Common Worship. Let us pray. Under your law, we live, great God, and by your will, we govern ourselves. Help us as good citizens to respect neighbors whose views differ from ours so that without partisan anger, we may work out issues that divide us and elect candidates to serve the common welfare. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. We are so glad that you joined us on this beautiful day, and we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday at 3 p.m. for our next video update. Go in love.